Hello AP History students and welcome to another session of AP Euroblast. I'm here to strike your interest in European history, activate your memory, draw connections, and get you ready for the exam. Well, by now many of you have already taken the exam, but some of you might need to take the second sitting. Maybe you had a schedule conflict the first time, or maybe you ran into technical difficulties the first time, or maybe you just want to stick around and find out what happens next. Welcome all. In the previous session, we looked at the various ways Africans and Asians responded to imperialism. In this session and in the next session, we're going to look at how Europeans responded to the rapid changes at home. Imperialism and industrialization were European creations to be sure but they affected the everyday lives of common Europeans in ways that they never could have imagined. As with Africans and Asians, European responses were varied and complex. And Europeans responded to these changes by making other changes in the arts, in politics, and in the sciences. In doing so, they fundamentally changed the way they viewed the world, nature, and not least of all, themselves. Let's start with an image in a well-known event, the premiere of Igor Stravinsky's ballet The Rite of Spring in Paris in 1913. For an audience expecting classical music and classical ballet, the performance was a jarring shock. Within the first five minutes, the atonal and broken rhythm of the music, and even more, the jerky movements and stomping of the dancers provoked loud murmurs that gradually grew, eventually drowning out the music until a full-blown riot had broken out. The musicians and dancers continued undeterred and were able to finish the performance, but not before 40 people had been forcibly removed from the concert hall. Why were the Parisians so upset at what they had just seen and heard? The Rite of Spring was part of a new tendency in music, art, and literature known broadly as modernism. It included such diverse movements as Impressionism, Cubism, Surrealism, and Dadaism in art and literature. But what they all shared in common was an attempt to make a radical break with Europe's classical traditions. Some people, known as Bohemians for their edgy lifestyle, were delighted by the newness of works like Stravinsky's, or by the outrageousness of Dadaism, such as Hugo Ball's nonsense poem, Caravane. Others recoiled at the break with traditional notions of harmony, balance, proportion, and beauty. It was this clash between old and new in the arts that led to that very physical clash between people that night at the Théâtre des champs Élysées. There are three big ideas I want you to get from this presentation and the next presentation. They're interrelated. Two are sequential, and the other is parallel to them. Imperialism significantly affected Europeans at home. It impacted society, diplomacy, and culture, and created resistance to foreign control abroad. And there's a subset to it. Direct and indirect exposure to non-European peoples influenced the styles of European artists and writers and led to debate about imperialism. Key Concept 3.5.3 runs more or less parallel to these other two concepts. They overlap one another, but follow each other more or less in sequence. After the 1848 revolutions, Europe turned towards a realist and materialist worldview. A new relativism in values emerged along with a loss of confidence in the objectivity of knowledge. This led to modernism in intellectual and cultural life. If you're thinking that the last two, about a realist and materialist worldview, and a relativism in values with a loss of confidence in the objectivity of knowledge, that they seem to contradict each other, you're right. But this just shows how much European thinking changed between the mid-19th century when anything seemed possible, in the early 20th century when the world seemed a much darker place, a view that World War I only served to confirm and to augment. In this session, we'll just focus on the realist and materialist worldview and save modernism, Stravinsky and others, for next time. Realism was a new artistic movement that started in the 1840s. Before we discuss it further, we have to understand that new artistic movements always try to be different from the ones before them. This gives us an opportunity to review briefly the artistic movements we've seen with some key examples. So here they are. The Renaissance broke away from somewhat stiff focus on religious imagery of medieval art to more naturalistic portrayals of new elite families in daily life. But then there was a shift from the Renaissance's realistic, detailed emphasis on the human body to the more stylized, elongated bodies and wild pastels of El Greco in mannerism, and to the suspended motion and drama of Baroque painting and sculpture during the Counter-Reformation, and then to the shift from the ornateness of the Baroque to neoclassicism's stylistic and sometimes thematic return to classical Greece and Rome, to the shift from neoclassicism's focus on balance, perspective, and proportion to the more frenzied notion and dramatic use of light of Romanticism. And breathe. This brings us to realism. Not only did painters such as Gustave Courbet and Jean Millet bring a stark, almost photographic approach to the detail of their subjects, they were real in their emphasis on the daily activities of common people, such as these stonebreakers, 
stoically preparing the way for a road as part of France's industrialization. Rather than the noble, sometimes wild, and highly individualistic ideals of romanticism, realism drew attention to the material existence and suffering of working people. Such sympathetic portrayals of the working class often made urban upper classes uneasy, if not downright hostile, towards realism. It reminded them of the 1848 revolution and the power working people had shown in demanding and then getting national workshops. They remembered all too well the rioting of the June days, so upper classes strongly disliked seeing powerful portrayals of the working classes. Millet's painting The Gleaners drew such criticism, and if we pay close attention to detail, we'll understand why. The background shows an abundant wheat harvest having just been gathered, supervised by a man on horseback. The harvest presumably will make a large profit for the landowner when sold in the city. The painting's focus, however, is on three peasant women in the foreground the gleaners of the painting's title. Unable to afford the grain that has been harvested, they are forced to gather or glean the loose seeds that are left over. The large size of a painting about labor that sympathetically portrayed a hard existence of powerful women was a very uncomfortable and deliberate message. Realism, mostly found in France and in Russia, was both influenced by and sympathetic to socialism. It continued to find expression in literature long after it had faded from painting. Here's an example from Emile Zola, who you will remember as the author of I Accuse, the powerful indictment of the high command of the French army in the scandalous Dreyfus affair. In this passage from his novel Germinal, he portrays the workers of a mine to an industrious ant colony. Little by little, the veins had filled, the faces were being worked at each level, at the end of each passageway. The all-devouring mine had swallowed its daily ration of men, more than 700 workers laboring now in this giant ant heap, burrowing through the earth in every direction, riddling it like an old piece of wood infested by worms. And in the midst of this heavy silence, under the crushing weight of these deep layers of earth, could be heard, if you put your ear to the rock, the movement of these human insects at work, from the flight of the cable raising and lowering the extraction cage to the bite of the tools digging into the coal at the bottom of the mine. The natural and social sciences also emphasized a materialist approach. Karl Marx emphasized a materialist analysis of history. All history was a struggle between classes to control production of wealth material. Ideas, leaders, wars, and everything else were secondary in Marx's view to this materialist struggle. At the same time, Charles Darwin developed a rational and materialist account of biological change. Evolution and natural selection explained the development of the human species. Darwin was certainly one of the most influential 19th century scientists, but there are many others. Germ theory was another important development in biology. This was one of the several advances in medicine we previously discussed in looking at the Second Industrial Revolution. Louis Pasteur and his discoveries of the principles of vaccination, microbial fermentation, and pasteurization saved countless lives. And Robert Koch elaborated on his work to unmask the bacterial agents of the century's two biggest killers, tuberculosis and cholera. At the beginning of the century, John Dalton had already introduced atomic theory into chemistry, which enabled much more systematic experimentation and investigation of chemical compounds. By the 1860s, the first periodic table had been formulated. In physics, electromagneticism brought together electricity, light, and magnetism, leading to big changes in work life. Likewise, Theoretical studies in thermodynamics led to discoveries that had real-life applications in converting heat to energy and in the development later of refrigeration. As a review side note, this is another example of Napoleon Bonaparte's lasting influence through the creation of École Polytechnique at the beginning of the century. Sadi Carnot was one of the early graduates and was the first physicist to propose a thermodynamic cycle, known by his name as the Carnot cycle, and he conceptualized the theoretical Carnot heat engine that we see here on the slide. Taken together, these discoveries in chemistry and physics as well as biology brought a tremendous sense of optimism among many, artists, thinkers, and politicians, as well as ordinary people. By the mid-century and well beyond, many placed an almost unquestioning faith in the possibilities for science to unlock the mysteries of the universe. The French philosopher Auguste Comte was one such person. He believed that humankind was living a moment of monumental historical importance. Comte attempted to synthesize all sciences into a coherent philosophy of science, and he created his own new discipline, sociology. He used theory as well as quantitative analysis to develop his arguments about universal principles of human society. 
Kant argued that human societies naturally transition through three stages of development. First, the theological, second, the metaphysical, and third, the scientific, also known as the positive stage. This was somewhat similar to the stages of human development from infancy to childhood to adulthood. In each of the stages, human societies understood the world and the relationship between individuals and society in different ways. In the theological stage, God was the reference point for understanding the place of individuals in society. All social and legal restrictions of human behavior were based on this understanding, and the wisdom of ancestors was accepted more or less without questioning. In the metaphysical stage, the accepted wisdom of the past was questioned, and humans used reason and questioning to develop new understandings of their place in relationship to society. The awareness of universal individual rights was achieved, and these rights were beyond the authority of human rulers to limit them. Although these rights were considered sacred or God-given, God began to be understood more metaphorically. Finally, in the positive stage, humans could find solutions to social problems using science, and science's power to impact positive change for humanity globally gave it authority not only over God, but even over the proclamations of human rights. Each stage was seen as one of progress over the previous stage. Kant has had a long-lasting influence on the world and even on two national histories. In 1908, followers of Kant's ideas led a revolt in Turkey that re-established the recently written constitution, and they forced the Ottoman ruler from power and established multi-party democracy for the first time. When Brazil transitioned from empire to republic in 1889, the new flag was inscribed with the words order and progress, a direct reference to Kant's positivist model. Love is a principle, and order is the basis, progress as the goal. Kant's synthesis of the sciences in history also hugely influenced Marx in his synthesis of the stages of human history into a series of class struggles. Marx and Kant, like many politicians of their time, were greatly excited by the possibility of science, and like the Enlightenment thinkers before them, had great faith that human beings could use their new understandings to perfect human existence. What Marx and Kant didn't fully realize is that they had a blind side that placed European history at the center of human history. It's not too hard to see that Kant's first two stages of human history correspond to European, and more specifically to French history, before and during the Enlightenment, and that the third stage corresponds to the time after Napoleon's fall. And after reading Kant, how was one to understand societies that had no conceptions of the rights of man, let alone an understanding of the importance of science to human progress? How was one to avoid seeing those societies as having a developmental, even a moral inferiority that matched their technological primitivity? And how was one to avoid the conclusion in the spirit of love as principle, or altruism as it came to be known? that more advanced societies had a moral obligation to help less developed societies advance to the next stages. Neither Kant, nor Marx, nor Darwin could foresee the dark twists that others would apply to their logic. Herbert Spencer was one such person that brought together the ideas of Kant and Darwin into a toxic cocktail that became known as social Darwinism. Societies did not simply move through stages of development, he argued, but as with species in nature, competed for access to resources and evolved to become stronger. It was Spencer, not Darwin, who coined the term survival of the fittest. Spencer was not a misanthropist, but he is known for attacking the interventionist liberal state that tried to protect the poor in England. By helping the poor, he argued, the state was interfering in a natural selection process and therefore slowing the improvement of humanity. In that sense, Spencer is the forerunner of what is known today as libertarianism. Certainly the ideas of Kant, Darwin, and Spencer could be understood, augmented, misrepresented, and applied to justify the socioeconomic and cultural positions of the powerful. Other thinkers were neither as sophisticated nor as nuanced as Spencer. A whole range of pseudosciences took hold in Europe and across the globe where people of European ancestry were dominant. The most insidious example is a culmination in the systematic study of phony genetics or eugenics in Nazi Germany. The realist and materialist views that we've examined today were fueled by industrialization, and they contributed to imperialism's advance. Not all realists and materialists favored imperialism, however. Marx, for example, was a huge critic of imperialism's inequalities. Just as realist writers and painters criticized the material inequalities of Europe itself. Next time we'll examine a different response to imperialism and industrialization, modernism. And we'll get back to that tumultuous premiere of Stravinsky's Right of Spring. Please leave your comments, remember to like, share, and subscribe, and keep learning! Thank you for watching. It's been a blast.